Series 11 was announced three years after Series 10 aired, but an unusual move, Dave also announced Series 12. They were to be filmed in one extended block and released a year apart. It made sense, getting the cast together was a hell of a task, so they might as well film as much as possible while they could. Craig Charles showed his dedication when he quit Coronation Street, the series from Back to Earth, in order to be available for the should. Baby Cow Productions replaced Grant and Naylor as a principal production company, though Doug Naylor continued as writer-director and his son Richard continued as producer. They shot in Pinewood's TV studio, almost 40% smaller than Shepperton's that they'd used in Series 10. This meant redecorating the sets as much as possible and generally employing as many tricks as they could to hide reuse. The shoot took place in late 2015 and early 2016, and Series 11 aired between September 22nd and October 27th, 2016. The first story is an nonsensically named Twentica, and introduces the new Starbug interior. Reusing sets on Series 10 left enough budget to bring back the bug. Personally, I prefer the more lived-in look of earlier Starbuck interiors, but this one's probably fresh, unused, and got the same upgrade as the Red Dwarf in Series 8. Anyway, we open with... Oh my god, what have they done to Crichton? It's like they took all my complaints for Series 10 and tried to fix them. But it's worse. Anyway, we open with some simulants that by Kevin Eldan. Who are you? Who am I? I'll tell you who I am. I'm the cleaner. Even though the Dwarfers have a full crew complement, the Simulants have somehow kidnapped Rimmer, and are demanding the return of a Simulant relic that they stole from a derelict in exchange for his return. Naturally, they've been using it to prop up the pool table in the back of the ship. They make the exchange, but the Simulants were lying. It's actually a time device that will allow them to go back and change human history. That's a bit old hat, isn't it? How many times have we seen that before? They will have no hesitation using hackneyed old cliches if it suits their purpose. Yeah, but if they go back in time far enough, they can invent that plot. The kidnapped Rimmer was actually from after the exchange was made. They kidnapped him using the time device. It makes sense if you don't think about it too much. I didn't think you were ever going to save me. I was kind of hoping we weren't. Taking a cue from Star Trek First Contact, they follow the simulants into the past to try and save the present. Nice touch in making the time tunnel look a bit like the original one from New Who. As they approach the Earth, they lose electronics, including Rimmer and Crichton, and crashing somewhere near Monument Valley. Crichton couldn't be more fried if it was a Mars bar living in Scotland. <laughs> Luckily, Lister is quite good at electronics when nipples are involved, so they manage to reboot everything. I love how post-crash, Cat's still messing with the steering wheel as though he could fly the bug out of a ditch. Anyway, time to explore. The simulants have been on Earth for several years. They hit the planet with the MPs and took over, outlawing higher technology and locking society in a weird Victorian 1920s, cleverly allowing the show to parody prohibition gangster tropes, even though it's the 1950s. Well, looky here, illegal contraband. <laughs> The technology ban is so humanity can't fight back against the new robot overlords. Anyway, they get a plot device from a dying technology bootlegger with instructions to take it to a science speakeasy. None of the usual bullshitting gets them into the club, but Lister's probably related to Joseph Lister, so they get in. He ain't related to the scientist Joseph Lister, is he? Uncle Joe! Of course I am. So, uh, you want to grab a drink first, or you want to go somewhere quiet and discuss relativity? The device that they brought is part of a machine designed to create a localized EMP and destroy the simulants. Unfortunately, all the local scientists at the speakeasy are theorists, so they don't have the practical knowledge to get the machine to work. So there's no scientists around who can put this thing together? We're all theoretical. So they need a man driven underground by the invaders. Albert Einstein. He's half goofy now, screaming at people who aren't there, walking around the park pushing a pram full of string. He's got some theory about it, but no one will listen. Pram theory? <laughs> I'm not really sure if Albert, theoretical physicist Einstein, would really be the sort of guy to ask to build an obscure piece of technology that they explicitly said theoretical scientists couldn't handle, but I'll take the plot's word for it. They track Einstein down, homeless, drunk, and crazy, so we can finish the machine. You can do this! I can do this?! We realize electrics isn't strictly Einstein's field. Well, I'm glad you at least realized that. In a way, it's moot as this isn't Einstein. Oh, he's just some old bum who pushes around a pram full of string? You got it. The simulants raid the bar, which instantly turns into a perfectly legal jazz club slash gin joint for the finale. In a bit of a twist, it turns out that these simulants were invented with the express purpose of changing history. Because future humans, I assume from some point when Lister's in hibernation, decided that humanity can't handle advanced technology. We are the good guys here. But you kill people! No one said that we couldn't have a little fun. 
Bit of a moot point, though, is they accidentally ignite a fight between two of the simulant leaders. He was slagging you off behind your back! <laughs> what? Look, just leave it three of 63. It's not worth it. Which buys time for the homeless guy they thought was Einstein to use his empty-headed, simplistic moron mind to find a solution. Two potato makes one potato! Fun fact, Einstein's played by David Stern, who played Corypheus in Dragon Age, and Rebecca Blackstone, who played Big Bang Barrel in the Speakies, he played Pre in Series 10. Hey, I don't do the Big Bang. <laughs> That's Barrel. And with the localized EMP is quickly hooked up to an invisible transmitter that'll somehow blast it worldwide, killing the Simulants, and Crichton, and Rimmer, and Cat's Hair Straighteners, and Starbug, if they don't escape fast enough. Leg it! <laughs> Which they do. I don't know what the rush was, they took an EMP to the face and they're no worse for wear. But you know, what's the script meant to do? Not give us Crichton being recharged by his nipples? I think we all know the answer to that. We end on a coda of Lister talking seriously, but the very real danger of letting technology have too much power over you. Don't rely on machines, Crichton, or else we lose the very thing that makes us human. Open! I'd complain about the complete change in the universe's history, that technology at any given point in the show should now be a hundred years less advanced after the change, and that time slides showed us that if you change the past, the present, including the Red Dwarf itself, also changes. But this is Red Dwarf. Occasionally, we're lucky if they keep continuity in the same episode. This one's not too funny. The idea is usually solid, and it is nice to have actual science jokes. The cops get the mitts on this. We're deader than Galileo's theory of tides. <laughs> It's just missing the extra spark that Rob Grant brought. Separately, Grant and Naylor are both good, but together, they're pretty special. Like a Legion, back in series six. Next up is Samsara, an unusual episode because half the plot doesn't deal with the Red Dwarf crew at all. It's sort of split between two different time periods. The crew investigating the aftermath of a disaster cross-cut with the events that led to said disaster. The Red Dwarfs come into orbit of a planet where the SS Samsara crashed three million years before. We open with Rimmer and Lister playing Minopoly, I'm guessing it's one of the Jupiter Mining Corporation's in-house games. Lister's cheating, Rimmer's not. That's an important plot point. And Rimmer needs anything but a two and a one to avoid defeat. Anything but a two and a one. A two and a one come to daddy. No willing it. Make this up. Pretty sure Doug Naylor could. Just lucky for you, I'm such a good loser! As part of Lister's reward, he gets to eat ice cream during the typical bunk room scene. As part of Craig Charles' reward for playing Lister, it was played by Cold Mashed Potato, though I'm not really sure if that counts as a reward. They receive a message from one of the Samsara's escape pods. The occupants were in stasis until the Red Dwarf approached. Alas, they were vaporized partway through the message. They're dead! Hey, the medical reports aren't in yet. We shouldn't jump to conclusions. <laughs> the Dwarfers can't work out exactly why they were vaporized, so decide to investigate the wreckage of the Samsara to try and figure it out. Three million years at the bottom of the sea. They made ships sturdy back in the... whenever the ship's from. The ship's dark. They find heaps of people killed mid-orgy. It's like the bits of the Pompeii tour they try to keep families away from. Check this. According to his dog tag, this man was the captain, Tom Cadry. Indecipherable gibberish. Oh, it means save yourself from hell. I don't want to spoil the eventual explanations for all this because it's really quite clever or go through the episode point by point. So I'll sum up each section and try to be vague. In a way, three million years back, a new transfer to the Samsar began having an affair with one of the crew members and everything began to go wrong for them. They're feeling sick, their hair is ruined, they randomly get injured, their food is crap. You get the idea. In the modern day, things start to go wrong for the Dwarfers. They get separated, the ship's in danger of being crushed, and it gets worse any time they do something selfless or decent. Like putting money in the charity box or saving people's lives. Very intriguing. And anyway, we get a nice section about evolution in Cat. Because Cat, unlike his distant ancestors, can't see in the dark. Who devolves that they can't see in the dark? Who evolves so you can't swing from trees? <laughs> this brings up something that I probably should have mentioned earlier. Why did Cat evolve to look like a human? because budget and because funny, but in-universe, the cat race evolved in spaces designed for humans. Bipeds with two arms. So it's not unexpected that evolutionary pressure eventually led them to being human-shaped. 
Crichton and Rimmer found the machine at the heart of everything that happened. You'll have to watch the episode to find out exactly what that is, but you'll be glad to know it was responsible for how the game went at the start of the episode. I threw a two and a one seven times in a row. What are the odds of that? About the same odds as being killed by a tangerine. <laughs> When you live long enough, everything happens. Because I don't want to reveal too much of the plot, I'll just take time to talk about wigs. Craig Charles has always used hair exchanges as a list star. Chris Barry started wearing a wig in the last few series as his Rimmer, but Danny John Jules apparently used a wig from series two onwards. I had no idea about this until they talked about it in the series 11 making of on the DVD. Though it makes sense because he's got short hair and most other things I've seen him in. Anyway, apparently the earlier wigs used Caucasian style hair and this new one for series 11 uses one that more closely mimics Danny John Jewell's real hair seen in series 1. Trivia! And back to the action, Crichton eventually works at the trick. They have to be horrible to each other in order to escape. Why? Not telling you. We just have to remember to avoid being honest, moral, kind, selfless, and helpful. It's not fair, you've got such an advantage. <laughs> so, why'd everyone die? why they get vaporized in that pod? It all makes sense in the finished episode, but you need to watch it for yourself. But trust me, it's worth it. This is a classic, it's not perfect, the ending's a bit weak, but that's a recurring thing for series 11 and 12. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing the scripts were overrunning, or they just ran out of ideas. But yeah, still a classic, like a cross between justice and terror form. How good is it? The episode stops dead for several minutes, so Cat can explain his theory about the origin of gravy, and it's still good. That's an achievement. Clang! Invents gravy! Nothing much else to say, really, except the fire alarm went off when they filmed, the cast, crew and audience had to be evacuated. They didn't finish shooting until close to midnight. Third is give and take, and we open in a spectacular hallway set. Rimmer's having an argument with a lift. He's desperate to check out a mysterious energy signature before it dissipates. Eventually, he's had enough and just fires the lift and tells the Scudders to find a replacement for another shaft. Tell all lifts we're interviewing for a new position in shaft 14. All applicants must be prepared to travel. Only lifts need apply. The Scudders are practical effects once again. They're basically the same as the originals, but 30 years of technical improvements have made them much cheaper to buy and much less likely to mess up during filming. Which they apparently did a lot during the older series. Lister's in a very bad state. He's been in bed for two days hungover. But is soon back on his feet because the Red Dwarfs found a medical station that's about to be destroyed by asteroids, so they're going to have to find any salvage as fast as they can. Anyway, Crichton's been deleting unnecessary files. I only trashed information I considered frivolous and idiotic. Without checking with me first? And you are? <laughs> the episode brings back the bazookoids. They've taken the lengthy barrel from the original, right, true and perfect version, and the horrible blue colouring from the Series 7 variant. But I'm not biased. Besides, they'll probably need them. The station's full of the usual ominous stuff that they come across on a nearly weekly basis. Skeleton. Check it out. My bet, it's dead. <laughs> Rimmer and Crichton find a cutting edge medical robot called Asclepius. At least they would if that wasn't clearly a Robbie the Robot impersonating snack machine. The actual Asclepius had a much more terrifying design, went mad, murdered the crew, kidnapped Lister and the cat, and removed Lister's kidneys. You're a little early. Take a seat in the waiting room. <laughs> I'll show you where it is. <laughs> well, that was almost brave of Rimmer. See, the old bazookoids would have taken him down in a hit or two. Bring back the old bazookoids, you cowards! Anyway, the kidney jar is destroyed in the firefight, but they rescue Cat and Lister, leaving Asclepius to die with the station. Crichton's injected a homemade dialysis into Lister, but it won't last for long. Luckily, they are somehow convinced that the silly-looking snack robot they found is Asclepius. Even more somehow that Cat can be a compatible donor. Cat won't do it, though, because he's Cat. Cat, if you don't give me a kidney and I die, think how you'll feel. Better than you! <laughs> so they try plan B, convince him that they made a mistake and it's him that needs the new kidneys. Hey there, buddy. I come to tuck you in. The plan, though, has a flaw that's never brought up. Cat would rather die than have his body be desecrated by having one of Lister's anything stuck in it. But I'll just call that another continuity issue. Up injection, sir. It'll help you relax. Oh, I very much doubt that. <laughs> they soon have to move on to Plan C, though, because again, the snack bot's not Asclepius. What's Plan C, though? Deus Ex Basic Plot of Stasis like to go back in time and steal Lister's kidneys, resulting in his two-day hangover from the start of the episode. So he never had any when he was going under the knife. 
Okay, so whose kidneys were shot by Rimmer? Everyone on board was a skeleton. My honest guess is Asclepius, while evil, was actually trying to save Lister's life and was going to jam them into the borderline plot hole in his abdomen. And he just had them on ice, probably taken from one of the long dead people. Anyway, they save Lister just in time to hog the lift that Pastromer wanted and cause the weird energy signature. I'm picking up several strange energy signatures on B deck. I need a lift pronto to check them out. Sir, your past self is calling for the lift. Ignore him, he's an idiot. Where would it be without me? Probably sat here without any kidneys. Whereas now I'm sat there without any kidneys. Good old me, eh? <laughs> Back in the past, Rimmer promised to promote the lift to a shrankier part of the ship if he didn't reveal the time shenanigans to his past self. I'll unfire you, promote you even. And when he doesn't, we get an epilogue of lift based vengeance. <laughs> This one's okay, the stuff with the robots and kidney removal was actually pretty strong, but the ending just threw its arms up in desperation and just remade Stasis Leak but a bit crap. If they'd taken some time to set everything up organically it would have worked better. The stealing Lister's kidneys to give them to himself idea is exactly the same as the Rimmer kidnapping in Twentica. And convincing the snack robot that he can go beyond his limitations and create a time portal is just like Homeless Einstein being told that he can construct the EMP also in Twentica. Some space between the episodes would have made it feel a little more original, but not by much because of the stasis leak stuff. I'm honestly kind of sad that Snacky hasn't appeared again yet. A snack machine somehow being able to rise to the occasion and accomplish anything he puts his mind to is some comedic possibilities. The next episode is Officer Rimmer, for many intents and purposes a remake of Rimmer World, with a wildly different setup, a sprinkling of quarantine, and a giant monster. The worst part of Later Red Dwarf is that most episodes, even the good ones, are similar to one or more previous ones. It's kind of like comparing Star Trek Enterprise to Star Trek Next Generation. I'm not blaming Doug Naylor though, he's written or co-written over 60 episodes. This was always going to happen. There's only so many stories you can tell with the same characters and people aren't endlessly inventive. We open in Starbug, they scan a deep space human explorer ship. A 24th century ship that explored so far from the usual human areas that it didn't have a crew. Instead, they 3D print them when needed. Quite a good sci-fi idea. Anyway, they start printing when they pick up Starbug, but it jams, leaving the captain with most of his face in the top of his head. This is Captain Edwin Herring of the SS Nautilus. Can you leave me, over? What? You look like you're wearing a toupee made of face! <laughs> the ship's about to be destroyed by an asteroid storm. Unfortunately, it's full of material that'll destroy most of the local area if it explodes. And if they get any closer, that will include Starbug. Rimmer ends a discussion of what to do by shooting the ship while they're still out of blast range. But the missile goes awry, destroying the ship's wing, sending it free of the asteroid field, and... This is a lot of build-up for the main plot. I'm promoting you to Officer Rimmer. I'd say roll credits, but that'd be a bit of a cinema sin. The worst kind of sin. Rumor's first order is to create a new officer's club in Red Dwarf, along with an officer's corridor, an officer's lift, a whole new class system. And worst of all, he's restricted the good entertainment channels to officers. Premier League Croquet, it's a grudge match. <laughs> Gosh. Doesn't look too bad, hold up. Anyway, they rendezvous with the other ship. It's totaled, so they just unload everything of use, including the bioprinter. Well, the cargo's safe at least. That means my mission's up. That's a pity I quite liked him. Rimmer is planning on printing a whole crew to lord over, while Cat and Lister are planning on finding someone who can demote Rimmer and printing them. Both of these plans get ruined when they find Lister's DNA on file. He sold his DNA when he was a kid and has primarily been used in call centers. What do you mean all those smart ass scouts and call centers are me? They know nothing and they sound like they don't want to be there. They don't, sir. They're you. <laughs> anyway, they decide to delete all the DNA files. It's better to never be born than be made to serve Rimmer. So Rimmer comes up with another plan, taking his own DNA and cloning a crew of Rimmers. The last of Rimmer's old DNA was destroyed in DNA. <coughs> but since there was some to create Rimmer World a few years later, and the living Rimmer in Series 8 was probably leaving DNA all over the place, this probably isn't a continuity issue. I'm not sure whether Rimmers are mainly in hologram uniforms though, but that's probably just to make filming simpler. Who wants to see an all Rimmer barbershop quartet? Mr. Rimmer! <laughs> We are what we see. Cat and Lister barge into the officers' club to try and find the bioprinter, so Rimmer prints some bouncers to throw them out. Alas, it goes a bit tits up and he somehow creates the end of Akira. I'm 
monstrous Rimmer hellbent and absorbing all the other Rimmers. Rimmers forced to resign his commission as an officer to escape the monster and get into the safety of the Grunt's Corridor. I don't know how that thing could absorb a hologram, but I also don't know how it could absorb the human Rimmers, so I guess this works. They use Rimmer as bait to lure at the Rimmer monster so they can kill it. <laughs> the one above Chris Barry looks like Richard E. Grant. We can't shoot! We might take out Mr. Rimmer! And the downside of that is... <laughs> But yeah, they kill it. This is a fine episode, a little thin on jokes, and somewhat derivative, but not bad. It's not helped with the fact that the setup's so complicated that it takes up over a quarter of the runtime. And the ad break means that the Dave episodes are shorter than the old BBC ones. It didn't leave much time for the character stuff to make the latter chunk of the episode really pop. The special effects are generally impressive, the bioprinting is a great idea that I bet they forget they can use, and some of the set design is spectacular. I have one potential issue though, if this is the original Rimmer and not the Series 8 Rimmer having died, then all of this is a little out of character. He went through some serious character growth between Series 1 and 7. He developed a friendship with Lister. He was a twat, but not this much of a twat, by the end. But seeing as this might be the Series 8 version, I can't really complain. But I am a bit confused about why Chris Barry played all the Rimmers in the Rat King, except for this one. Next is Crisis, the Crichton episode. We open with the character stuff. Crichton's nearly three million years old, so just the right age for a midlife crisis. He's forgetting to make meals, he's lost his love of mopping, everything feels absurd and pointless. If everything in the universe is going to end, including time itself, what is the point in cleaning above eye level? Good question. <laughs> anyway, as part of a sad monologue, we actually find out when Crichton was built. 2,976,000 years ago, meaning he was created about 24,000 years after Red Dwarf launched. I came off the conveyor belt 2,976,000 years ago today. Making him the most advanced piece of human-made technology they've ever encountered, at least out of the ones we have rough dates for. We get some nice character stuff as Cat can't even conceive of a midlife crisis. This is where the show still shines, the unapologetically alienness of Kat's personality. Have you ever felt there's so much more I could have been? No! <laughs> have you ever felt if I went back in time and had my time again, I'd... Forget it. <laughs> anyway, Crichton's trying out a sporty new red Iron Manish body. It's faster, it sounds like a racing car. Let's him rotate his head and can play jungle music. <laughs> you feel that bass? Is that not some serious bump? I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it! They decide to try and show him how much he's evolved ever since they found him in the Nova 5. To do this, they tracked in another mechanoid. Of course, that'll be a hell of a long journey, so they're going to stasis. I guess Kachansky is very dead by the time they wake up. Anyway, the other mech's called Butler, and he's basically stolen Legion's pad. After the crew died, I converted this space into a gallery, so I had somewhere to keep the paintings. His ship, the Nova 3, was on a mission to a science station that was attempting to make contact with the universe itself. Not God, the universe. It crashed, and once the crew died, Butler spent the next few million years bettering himself and becoming an expert in everything. Incidentally, if any of you have any diseases, I most probably have an antidote. Breakthrough medical cures is a hobby of mine. He paints, he writes concertos, he's written novels, he's cured most known diseases and improved Starbuck. This isn't having the desired effect on Crichton's ego, but they stay because Rimmer wants to try and convince Butler to come with them. And anyway, I pretty soon a war party of Gelfs arrive with killing on their minds. Prepare yourself to die, human ship of scum. Equahecte, is that you? <laughs> Butler? <laughs> yeah, he's also friends with the local Gelfs, so they don't end up being murdered, which is nice. Crane's feeling even worse. Butler's not only more successful, but an inferior model. Butler is several generations before me, and yet he's done so much more with what he's been given. As you'd expect, Butler doesn't stay and they make it to that universe communication station. Still operational, and it worked. The universe is sentient and it's a Morgan Freeman impersonator. Uh, to whom am I speaking, please? I am the entity known to you as the universe. It's voiced by the same guy who played the lift and give and take. Anyway, it goes pretty much as you'd expect. Crichton tries to get answers from the universe to give his life meaning and solve his midlife crisis, and he accidentally gives the universe one. Wait, I'm gonna die? <laughs> Classic. Much of the episode is character-based comedy, the sort of thing that I can't go into much detail about without ruining all the jokes. It kind of reminds me of series one or two, character-heavy in a simple story, though large in scale. This is another one of the better episodes of the series, and I really like Butler. 
I think he's my favourite Crichtonish mech that we've seen so far. He's just so pleasantly condescending. Uh, you own all these paintings? I painted the paintings. <laughs> it gives me a break from the concertos I put on to entertain the vending machines. And I still treasure the Gelfberry wine you gave me. Best weed killer I've ever had. So we have a blue blanc cœur roulette de main, or if you prefer, <laughs> bacconcini brochettes with a tomato and balsamic reduction. Before I show you the rest of my ship, I have to make one thing very clear. I have no intention of ever leaving the Nova 3. My only captain now is my own muse. Good luck, my friends, and may every day bring us each a little more wisdom. Doug Naylor's inspiration was the cast Advancing Age, and apparently Robert Llewellyn took some offence for a while. Anyway, the last episode of the series is kind of Worms, a story that was sort of cannibalised from the enemy within. The unmade episode from series 7. A bit, if you squint. Its plot was very simple. Cat meets other cats and needs to have sex, or he'll die. That's one of the episodes I'll finally go into detail when I do my episode in Unseen Dwarf. The US pilots, cancelled episodes, stuff like that. They're on Starbug, and during a recent trip, Crichton found a personality tuck machine. It does plastic surgery on the personality. Rimmer signs up, but the second lasers through the skull get mentioned, he suddenly has other plans. I'm just in that, but where's he gone? <laughs> that door left. Einstein was wrong. It is possible to break the speed of light. Anyway, they're off course, and to get back to the Red Dwarf, they need to pass through Gelf country. A particular tribe of Gelf that inhabit Belt Juno 98 are the Nyechin Sorry, I just sat down on a screwdriver. Legend has it that the area is inhabited by vampire Gelfs who drink virgin's blood. Why? Because they're finally doing the cat sex thing. Hang on a minute, are you? No! I suppose you must. No! Never really Don't even say it! They detect a transport with a deranged mechanoid and a prisoner on board. The mechanoid's pledge to sacrifice its life in a mission in exchange for software updates in Silicon Heaven. The ship sours from diving into a black hole. The mech's mission is to kill its prisoner good and proper. Normally, the dwarfers would assume the worst about the prisoner and find a less dangerous storyline to get involved in, but not today. Otherwise, there'd be no plot. The ship's dark, dangers in the air. Perfect for one of the show's best alien parodies. You know what else is good for alien parody? Mysterious life forms. They're there, right on top of you! Uh, maybe in the ceiling or under the floor! Run! Go back! Get out of there! Move! Are these life signs, could they by any chance be us? <laughs> the crazy mechanoid looks really cool, but they have to kill it to get to the main part of the plot. Stuff with the prisoner, who's a cat, brilliantly channeling Danny John Jules back in series one. That's mine. That's mine. All this is mine. <laughs> That's mine too. Cat and the other cat is one of the most adorable things I've ever seen. Ow! <laughs> Sadly, it's really short lived because she's actually a polymorph. The reveal is actually very well timed. It gives you just enough time to wonder why the hell she was being kept prisoner before explaining it. Anyway, the polymorphs inject a bunch of eggs inside Cat. Not that he realizes it, because he's still not really sure what sex says. And afterwards, she said she'd never been with anyone who could hold so many eggs! Everything from Cat's Night Out with a Polymorph is easily some of the best stuff in the series. From his description of what happened, to his insistence that it counts as sex... Why doesn't it count?! <laughs> it's magical. The Polymorph, having deposited its eggs, has taken its final form. A rejected Guillermo del Toro monster and died, leaving Cat pregnant with a whole litter. The pregnancy thing actually echoes another on mid episode, Dad, from series 3, which was about pregnant Lister. So they plan to do a caesarean, but all the polymorphs have a defense mechanism and turn into tumors. If they try to remove them, cattle die, so they have to be born. And it is amazing. They're assuming the shapes of household objects, trying to blend in. This stuff is better than Emo Hawk, at least it's doing something new. They try to space the babies, but they're using their unstoppable cuteness defenses. So cute! Sir, they're evil genetic mutants! I said flush them. We'll be just round the corner, sir. It looks like it's a technical mess up as they walk away from the box of baby polymorphs, but it's actually just a ridiculously reflective box. Anyway, the litter influences Cat's mind to take them to safety, and the others decide to go down into the bowels of the ship to try and find and kill them. The start of the episode comes into play as they use the personality tuck to remove Lister's emotions, to make him invisible to the now mature and dangerous polymorphs. Unfortunately, it also turns him into a sociopath. How did you know that wasn't the cat? 
I didn't. So I had to shoot him. Why not? This results in five paranoid minutes of our heroes and the polymorphs pretending to be our heroes trying to work out who exactly is an imitation, until the vaguely clever finish in a coda with Cat and two lady cats. Don't you know a cat always has two homes? I try to tell him, but he won't listen! That's a dream, but I really wish it wasn't. Can of Worms is probably the best episode of the series. The stuff of the polymorph lady cat, the alien parody, really works. They managed to do what Emohawk couldn't and come up with some new stuff for the polymorph. Great work. It's just a pity that it took almost a third of the story to get started. But that's a usual Series 11 thing. Overall, Series 11 is like 10. Better than 7 or 8, but not as good as 3 to 6. I'd say it's about the same quality as Series 1 or 2, but nowhere near as original. The worst episode is probably Twentica or Officer Rimmer, but neither really bad, just missing something. Mm -hmm.